Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's session of Getting to Know Goddard. Our topic today is the search for life from test tubes to rocks to worlds we cannot see. This speaker series was created to introduce the public to the work being done at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. My name is Dina Trask and I work in the Office of Communications at Goddard. As part of my job, I go to events and I talk about the missions um, coming from the Goddard Space Flight Center. I've talked to small groups and large groups and independent one-on-one uh, -on -one times with people. And I've hosted the Getting to Know Goddard several times now. And I can tell you it is so much easier to speak to a live audience than to speak to the computer screen as I'm doing now. So kudos to the television reporters who have to do that and to our speakers today who are working that too. A few things for today's presentation. We have found that Chrome and Firefox work best. If you're having technical difficulties, log out and try again with Chrome and Firefox. We will have time for questions and answers after hearing from today's speakers, and you can post your questions in, in the chat box at any time. This presentation will be recorded and posted to this channel with closed captioning. During our Q&A session, we'll be joined by Dennis Furick, who is Director of Operations for the Maryland Space Business Roundtable. He's also Vice President of Strategy at University Space Research Organization, Association, the USRA, who is a contractor at Goddard. In today's session, you'll hear about Goddard's work in the science field known as astrobiology, which encompasses many disciplines such as chemistry, biology, physics, geology, and several others. Our science and exploration work focuses on learning how life is formed and involved in finding evidence of life. Today's speakers will tell us how they search for precursors of life in meteorites and asteroids and for life's chemical fingerprints in other worlds. They will also address the fundamental yet vexing question at the heart of NASA's search for life. Will we recognize life when we see it? If you've watched a Getting to Know session in the past, you've heard me say that I work with really smart people, and today you'll meet a few more of them. Our first speaker is Dr. Heather Graham. She's an organic chemist, I'm sorry, an organic geochemist, and I'm going to read a little bit of this because their work is too important for me to leave to my memory. So Heather Graham is an organic geochemist in Goddard's Astrobiology Analytical Laboratory. Dr. Graham focuses on the development of fundamental tools and techniques to help identify evidence of living systems that may be different from life on Earth. She collaborates widely with missions to small bodies, such as NASA's OSIRIS-REx and the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency's Hayabusa 2. I hope I pronounced that right. Hayabusa 2. She has field experience in locations ranging from subsurface of cratons to the treetops of neotropical rainforest. What a great career. Then we'll also hear from Dr. Jose Aponte. He's an astrochemist who also works in Goddard's Astrobiology Laboratory. Dr. Aponte develops analytical methods to measure signatures of small organic compounds present in meteorites. He is a senior co investigator Investigator for the NASA Astrobiology Institute at Goddard Center for Astrobiology. He is a collaborator on science team for asteroid sample return missions such as OSIRIS-REx and Hayabusa 2. Our third speaker is Dr. Hannah Kaplan, who is a research space scientist in Goddard's Planetary Systems Laboratory. She uses remote sensing to understand the composition of planetary surfaces, asteroids and meteorites, with the goal of determining the distribution of water and organics in our solar system. Dr. Kaplan is a member of the science teams for OSIRIS-REx and the LRALF instrument on NASA's Lucy spacecraft, which is launching later this week to study the Trojan asteroids. So thank you again for joining us, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Heather. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining. This is really exciting to get to join this panel. And I'm just going to start us off with a little intro into the kind of work that we do in astrobiology and the search for life. I'm sure you're all imagining us looking for aliens and really futuristic things. But really, a lot of our work involves thinking about the past, sometimes the very distant past, 
Many of us in the panel have worked on origins of life type problems, and thinking about how our life originates on any planetary surface really helps us think about what's necessary for life. We also approach questions about evolution of life in astrobiology. That helps us think about the feedback between life and a planetary surface where we find it. And of course, that all leads us to thinking about the distribution of life. What other planets are we likely to find on? What's needed there? Does it have all the ingredients where you could find life? So at the same time as we're thinking about the future, we're also investigating the past. A lot of the tradition of tools and techniques in astrobiology comes to us from paleobiology, or what we might think of as paleontology, since astrobiology is telling us the story of life and time. And we need to think about time in this way because the distant past would be just as unfamiliar to us as other planets. Life has been on Earth for 3.5 billion years, and if you were to go back during many of the times during life's history, you would probably not even recognize it. You probably wouldn't even recognize it as Earth. You might think you were on the moon of Enceladus around Saturn. Earth has had many different atmospheres over its history, many different configurations of its continents on the surface, many different chemistries in its ocean. Even the tides and the sunlight were different in the distant past. And all of that frames how life has arisen and evolved on this planet. We can think of ancient life as even seeming to be extraterrestrial. If we were to go back in time, we might not even recognize some of the critters that are around there, just as we have um, distant relatives of those same organisms now on our surface that seem so strange to us. One thing to remember about astrobiology and the history of life and how it works with planets is that it's a record of all of that adaptation. Everything that's alive today records all of that time and the feedback that happened between that organism and the environment as recorded by its, its uh, structure and its genetics um, through that time. We wouldn't be able to look at something in the distant past and imagine what it's going to look like in the future. Just like in this slide, I'm showing you the very first evidence we have for plants in the Rhiney chert. Um, about 500 million years ago. And you wouldn't imagine if you see these strange little structures in this rock, like on the left, that someday that might be a crocus or a tree. Life records all of that adaptation in the things that we now see. So that gets us to the question of, but what is life? And more importantly, is it necessary for us to define life in order for us to look for it other places? A lot of times when we think of life, we're just really describing what it looks like. And that's a kind of easy way to think about it. And we can see life at many different scales, but when we look at it, we should be thinking about, but what is it doing? When we think about life at very small scales, like this salmonella microbe that I'm showing, that's an optimized structure that's just a cell doing a lot of chemical business in the environment that it's in. It's, it's very complicated for the kind of jobs and environment it does, and we don't think of it as being primitive in any way because it represents this um, interaction with its environment that you and I wouldn't be able to do. But we can then also look at life on large scales. We can think about the kinds of adaptations that life had to evolve in order to contend with environments. The ability to develop specialized organs to sense the environment, to reproduce, to interact in large communities. And of course, you might think I'm talking about the elephant in this picture, but that also describes the things that the grass is doing as well. So these are just ways of describing life and seeing it, but is that really what life is? When we think about going out into the solar system and looking for life, a way that we can think about it that gives us more uh, scope for our imagination is to think about what is the fundamental thing that life does and can us help us to recognize it in very unfamiliar settings like the distant past or very far away planets. And one thing that we can think about that's very general to help us recognize life in different places is the fact that life is and 
uh, discussion with its environment. It's an energetic response to its environment that can be recognized as a physical or chemical effect. One way that you can think about that is if you see an imprint in an environment, and that can be a physical thing or a chemical thing, it can be something that's a structure in a rock, or it can be a molecule that you can find. If you don't think there are ways that that can be abio abiotically created, that means created without life, um, then that means there was an extra push of energy needed to make that structure or molecule. And in this case, um, many of the cases that we're thinking about, that extra push of energy can be life. So think of life that way if you're trying to be general, is that response, that energetic response to an environment. So how do we recognize life when we're going out into the stars and looking for it? We talk a lot about things we call biosignatures, and that's a physical indication of past or present life. And when I say physical, it can be a structure or a molecule, since molecules are physical too. And many of the things that you're going to hear about in the next couple of talks are going to involve molecules, since all of us here are chemists and like to talk about molecules a lot. But biosignatures can be simple. A biosignature can be a footprint, like the ones we left on the moon. Long time from now, other astrobiologists from other planets might come to our moon and see those footprints and know that something was alive there. Or they can be very complicated, like the picture on the left that shows the imprint left behind by microbial biofilms 2.5 million years ago on those rocks. Biosignatures can tell us something about life since life has special structures and those structures are hard to make without life just like some molecules are hard to make without life we can see that at a variety of scales from an organism down to the cellular level and each of those um, shapes and the things that those um, organisms are made of represent something very different than the abiotic environment around it because they've used energy to create something very different that's recognizable um, as, a, as it is distinguished. And of course, that includes very complicated molecules that are used in, in organisms that can preserve on very long timescales in the geologic record or for as long as an organism needs it in its life cycle. We can also think of biosignatures from very large macroscopic scales, like this planetary scale expression that we see here. You're probably going to hear a lot about remote sensing in the next couple of talks. And what that really means is imagery that you can take from space of a planet and look at either chemistry in the atmosphere or some feature that you see on the surface to try and understand life there. We can even do that on our own planet, like we see in these pictures, where we can see um, that swirl is actually a bloom of organisms in our ocean, and um, those organisms are busy metabolizing uh, their food and changing the atmosphere that we have in our in our around our planet. And both of these things can be observed from space. We have a tool that we like to use in astrobiology that we call the ladder of life. And this is um, a way of trying to describe all the different things that we could use to try to find life on another planet. And we arrange this ladder from the bottom rungs being things that are very generalizable that really all life will probably need or have um, and that are fairly uh, easy for us to think about detecting. Um, and then at the top of the ladder, we have things that are a little bit more refined for the way we understand life on Earth and might require very long time scales for us to understand. So when we think about looking at other planets, we can, we can think of each rung on the ladder as being a target for the kind of thing that we'd want to find on another planet to help us understand life. And some of these things might be surprising to you. Um, you're going to hear a lot about chirality, which is shapes of molecules. Um, you might not realize that metals and the way they distribute on the surface of a planet can be a really important way of understanding the presence of life. And then, of course, there's the business of life, metabolism, growth and reproduction, mobility. All of those things can help us understand life as well. And this is just a tool that NASA uses for helping us describe the analytes, the things we're going to look for on other planets. 
And there's lots of places where we can look for life. We're looking for life outside of our own solar system, even far, far away on exoplanets, planets around other suns. And we're using those big scale kinds of tools, specialized telescopes that can tell us the chemistry that is on those planets, what's in their atmospheres, for example. And we can look at the composition of those atmospheres and try to deduce if there might be life on that planet. We can come closer home and look for life on objects in our own solar system. We can use the same kind of tools as we do for exoplanets, remote sensing, where we're using um, light from those objects to tell us something about their chemistry. It might be the atmosphere, it might be the surface or the ocean on that world. And then of course, we also have things like rovers. We do in situ, in place investigations of solar system objects where we can go and actually send a, a scientific instrument to the surface of another world and, and dig at it and see what we can find if there's any indication of life from that ladder of life, those things that we think of as our targets. Um, this is things like Dragonfly, the, the Mars Science Laboratory, the Clipper that's going to Europa. Those are in situ kinds of operations that we can do. Some of the talks that you're going to hear about are about smaller bodies than even planets, things like asteroids and pieces of other planets are great ways to investigate the possibility for, astro for life elsewhere or think about its building blocks, those biosignatures, those fundamental chemicals that we know life needs. Um, we can go to another world like OSIRIS-REx did and bring it home. Um, and, and analyze it here. We can even go to other planets and do the same thing, like the Perseverance rover is doing by caching those drill tubes um, on the surface of Mars for us to go and collect. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a lot of patience, though, you don't have to go to another planet to investigate it and um, see what kind of things it's made of and how it informs your ideas about life. You can wait for it to come for you. And this is uh, something that Jose Aponte does a lot of. He looks at meteorites. Those are pieces of those asteroids that have come to our planet, or sometimes even pieces of Mars or other planets that are here. And now we can use our scientific in instruments and investigate um, the molecules and the structures that are in there to help us understand the possibility for life and how it originates. I also like to go to a lot of places on my own planet and think about the possibility for life there. I'm very fond of going to the subsurface of the planet in places where we don't really seem to find a whole lot of life. And some of these places have been out of communication with the rest of the world for billions of years, off on their own evolutionary journeys. And it makes it very hard for us to find organisms in these places since they're so distantly related to our ourselves and the, the current biology that we have on the surface. This is almost a form of astrobiology since I'm thinking about um, these distant relatives um, that relate to us and help us understand life. So I wanted to just remind everyone that what we're mostly talking about in the next couple of talks is molecules, chemicals that help us understand life. Life not just as it exists now, but how it originates and how it might originate on other worlds. And so think of this as molecules produced by life made from material delivered from distant stars, that origin, evolution, and distribution, that story of life and time. Thanks so much. Um, hello, my name is Jose Aponte. I'm an um, astrochemist at the, analytical, as, at the Astrobiology Analytical Lab at NASA Goddard. And uh, thank you, Heather, for such a great introduction. So um, let's see. Um, there are different ways in which we can study a prebiotic chemistry or astrochemistry. Um, you can use, or astronomers can use, uh, two different types of telescopes, those that could be uh, on the Earth or in outer space, um, to look for these signals, which are um, uh, indications of different molecules, right? And so, for example, uh, we have the Atacama Large uh, Millimeter uh, Array uh, in Chile, and we also have the uh, Hubble telescope, which has given us um, such a, a lot of information about the different chemicals that we can find, for example, in interstellar uh, locations, right? And, and the peaks that you see here, or the spikes that you see here in these pictures, each one corresponds to a different molecules, and we can um, identify them very precisely, and we can see that 
some of them, for example, will be water, uh, methanol, um, and different different molecules that will be the basic building blocks um, of what eventually could become life, right? So a different way to study astrochemistry is by doing in space measurements or in situ uh, measurements um, and also using sample return missions. So a good example of um, an in situ analysis is like Heather uh, mentioned, the Curiosity rover. It's, a, it's a, the best, probably the best example. But another one that I like is the Rosetta mission, which uh, travel to this uh, far um, comet and eventually landed a set of equipment that in the year 2014 it detected glycine. Uh, this instrument is called Rosina, and this, um, this instrument was able to detect uh, glycine on the surface of um, this comet, and that is amazing, right? Because we don't expect to find uh, molecules of life in such a far away and distant uh, locations. And even if we find uh, molecules that could be important for life, uh, we can uh, probably not say that we, that we found life, right? So um, another way to, to study uh, prebiotic chemistry would be what I do, which is the analysis of uh, laboratory simulants and meteorites. So a set of uh, simulants could be made by, for example, synthesizing interstellar ice analogs. So uh, astrochemist will um, find out or will figure out what are the chemical and physical conditions of um, interstellar locations and will try to mimic uh, those conditions of temperature and also um, the organic components that could be found there. And so they will uh, add a, a source of energy uh, for example, it could be uh, ultraviolet light. And with that energy, uh, they will drive different chemical reactions, which will uh, increase the diversity of molecules. And again, uh, we, will, we will find molecules that could resemble or could be used as the building blocks for life. Another very good example is the experiments done by uh, Yuri uh, Miller, uh, which uh, prepare this primordial soup, right? So, so they um, try to mimic how the early Earth uh, looked in terms of uh, different organic comp comp compounds and in terms of uh, temperature, pH, uh, pressure. And so they um, apply um, energy source in, this, in, the, in the way of uh, electri electricity. And with this, they were able to synthesize many of the molecules that are important for life, right? So, uh, but in reality, all of those chemical reactions uh, have already happened in um, different bodies in, in, in our solar system, for example. So uh, if we look at asteroids, asteroids are, think of them as as remnants of, of what did not become a planet or a moon or something like, you know, a big uh, solar system object, but has remained unaltered for, uh, for a very long time um, since it formed. So when we find meteorites on Earth, uh, we are collecting a little bit of, uh, of this uh, history that has been encapsulated for, for such a long time. Um, these meteorites, especially those that are carbon rich, um, will, will contain the chemical signatures that were present when the solar system was forming, when the planets were forming, when, when uh, the, the, the moons and, 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 and life was starting to breathe on this planet. Uh, and we will use uh, very different uh, instruments in our laboratory to uh, figure out each of those individual compounds and try to understand how chemistry, how organic chemistry could have started uh, in outer space and how it could have helped the origins of life on Earth. So this is the this is a picture of our laboratory here at Goddard. And we use a really broad range of instrumentation uh, that will tell us the exact molecular um, structure of the compound. 
uh, we can also detect if the compound is um, from outer space or from the Earth, meaning uh, if it's probably some contamination that, that, that occurred in the meteorite or if it's indeed uh, extraterrestrial. And uh, with this, we can um, make an inventory of all the different organics that uh, could have been uh, made before the uh, solar system perhaps was, was forming. And with that, we can uh, understand um, how and how the Earth also looked at that time. Uh, and we cannot do this uh, by looking at the Earth because a geological and biological process have already erased um, this information. And so um, we prefer, or it's, it's going to be easier for us to look at meteorites to try to understand how organic chemistry happened uh, before um, biology arrived on this planet. Um, meteorites will help us to, uh, or the organics present in meteorites, will help us to understand how, uh, in general, organics can form in, in outer space and uh, how, uh, and their, their distribution will help us understand what kind of processes has already happened in uh, planetary bodies in our solar system. And with that, with that catalog of organics and with those uh, type of processes, we can understand how perhaps uh, life could have emerged on this planet and perhaps on, on other locations. And so, for example, going back to the to the uh, finding of glycine in a comet, uh, understanding uh, the basic building blocks of um, comets, asteroids will tell us what can, uh, will, will uh, give us a, a will give us a question of like how can we make an amino acid uh, out of these small building blocks, right? And um, so that's that's one of the aims of, of the work I do. I try to understand uh, the full inventory of organics and try to understand what processes could have resulted on the synthesis of the molecules that we uh, um, need for life. So meteorites are mostly uh, collected uh, in Antarctica. A group of scientists will go to Antarctica to um, collect uh, carbonaceous chondrites or other, other uh, meteorites that are present in the surface. And, um, but also meteorites can fall in different locations, uh, like for example, uh, the Aguasarcas meteorite, which fell in Costa Rica. And I just want to point out that this meteorite fell, uh, it, it, it could have fell in the ocean, it could have fell in like uh, rainforest, but it fell in the town of Aguasarcas, more specifically uh, in the house of Rocky. Um, Rocky is, uh, is safe, but um, just keep in mind that they can fall anywhere at any time. So, um, and if you happen to find or be in the midst of this uh, um, shooting star event, uh, and you are able to collect uh, some of these rocks, you could uh, either donate it for science as you should, or sell it for quite a lot of money on, on the internet. Um, once we get meteorites in the laboratory, uh, a chip of a meteorite, for example, we will proceed to make a powder out of it. And then the powder will be extracted with a type of solvent, um, depending on the type of analysis that we will be doing. So for example, if we want to look for amino acids in meteorites, we will use water because amino acids dissolve very well in water. So once we get all the meteorites, all the uh, amino acids in this uh, liquid solution, we will proceed to purify it and apply uh, certain um, analytical techniques to understand each of those individual amino acids. And indeed, we have found um, many, 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 many amino acids uh, in, in, in meteorites. Uh, specifically, we have found all of the ones that are important for life. And we have also um, detected that uh, there is a there is a good link between the origins of life on Earth and meteorites. Why? Because uh, life on Earth is uh, chiral, meaning uh, they it uses uh, left-handed amino acids only. Um, there is no um, an abiotic process, or there is no way to make these uh, amino acids um, one over the other. So, so if you make a chemical reaction 
uh, you will always get 50% uh, of each of those two types of amino acids. But what we have found is that meteorites also contain a, a little bit of an excess of the left-handed version of amino acids. And we also are made of that uh, type of amino acid, which are left-handed. So therefore you have a link between um, the uh, how those uh, meteorites could have um, aided the, the audience of homo chirality and life uh, on this planet. Um, we also don't, we work for with meteorites because meteorites are the perfect analogs for the, for the analysis of samples from outer space, right? And specifically sample return missions. Uh, the most famous sample return missions are of course the Apollo missions, which brought uh, soil and dust and rocks from the moon. And we are currently analyzing those samples uh, more than 50 years after they were collected. And um, another good example of a sample return mission was uh, is, is the Stardust mission, which uh, collected uh, tiny crystals of, of ice that was coming off uh, com uh, a comet. And when we were able to analyze those uh, tiny crystals, we also found uh, many molecules, including glycine, and that was the first detection of glycine on, on a comet. And um, now I'm part of OSIRIS-REx, and so meteorites help um, to develop all the techniques and all the uh, infrastructure that we uh, need to um, to analyze the samples brought by uh, OSIRIS-REx, which Hannah Kaplan will uh, tell you more about in the next talk. For now, I just want to tell you that uh, asteroid Bennu, uh, this is the picture of Bennu, which uh, at, at 50 miles away, and uh, Bennu will be collecting, um, actually Bennu already collected uh, more than 60 grams of sample, which was our initial target. And those samples will be uh, brought to the lab. Uh, well, a, a portion of that, uh, that sample will be brought to the lab in September 2023 so that we can do all the analysis uh, that we um, do for a meteorite, uh, but this time in, in, in a sample that will be very clean, uh, very pristine. And uh, yeah, it, we, we, plan, we plan to um, find so many compounds and understand how uh, they came up to be. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Hannah Kaplan, and I am the final speaker today. And I will be bringing you uh, deeper in depth on the OSIRIS-REx mission, which has been mentioned a number of times now. Um, but OSIRIS-REx is NASA's first mission to a near-Earth asteroid. Uh, OSIRIS-REx visited asteroid Bennu. It orbited around the asteroid at very close proximity, uh, took a lot of pictures and other measurements of the asteroid. And then, uh, as Heather and Jose have said, uh, we collected a sample of that asteroid, which is on its way back to Earth right now, uh, back to Jose's lab, where I know he'll be very excited to get a look in on it. Uh, but my job, really is to work with the spacecraft data and to give Heather and Jose the context they need from these remote observations to understand, uh, you know, asteroid Bennu as a whole. And so the OSIRIS-REx mission was not a life detection mission. We did not go out to try and find life. Um, rather, we are looking for origins. That's the O in OSIRIS-REx. Uh, the goal is to return a sample that we think might have molecules in it that are the precursors to life. Um, for a variety of reasons, we don't think that there is life itself on Bennu, um, but rather that it, it tells us something about us and how we got here on Earth. And so I'll be telling you more about this organic detection on Bennu, which we did through spectral interpretation, the SI part of OSIRIS-REx. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit more about the instruments on board OSIRIS-REx and the sort of observations that we did. Uh, and so, you know, with all this discussion of 
uh, looking for life on Earth and looking at meteorites, you might ask, okay, why send a spacecraft out to space in the first place? You know, why not wait for a meteorite to fall? And I think hopefully this, you know, image is worth that thousand words that I could write on why we send spacecrafts out. Uh, but this is on the left what we knew about Bennu before we got there. This is our kind of highest resolution understanding. And on the right is the beautiful mosaic image of asteroid Bennu as we know it now. Um, and so, you know, what being there with the spacecraft allows us to do is one, to collect a sample, uh, which uh, allows us to get what we call pristine material. So meteorites have to travel through the Earth's atmosphere, which can is a pretty violent process and can get rid of some of the stuff that we're really interested in. So if we go right to the source, you know, we get rid of that step that get and make sure that we get, you know, the best sample possible. We also actually needed to be at OSIRIS-REx in orbiting very close to the asteroid uh, to contextualize the sample, to understand Bennu's basic geology and overall composition so that we understand if the sample that we brought back is an, anom an anomaly or if it is, you know, looks like generic Bennu. Uh, these things are, you know, an important part of the of studying geology anywhere and are, you know, equally important when we're bringing back a geologic sample of Bennu. And so you might ask, how are we actually doing uh, this sort of geology at Bennu? And we have to look with the spacecraft and that, you know, is limiting in some ways. It would be a lot easier to send a person um, to look around, you know, feel some of the rocks, collect the best sample. We're actually really, as a human, we're, we're very good at that. Um, but instead, we kind of have to send some proxies. Uh, and so the spacecraft has a number of instruments on it that tr attempt to do this job for us. And so one of them in the top right here is called OLA. It's a laser altimeter. Uh, this, this is the sort of thing that's used on some self-driving cars. Basically, you're shooting a laser at the surface and you're measuring the time it takes to get that signal back, which gives you really, really high resolution topography. Uh, and uh, lets us understand Bennu's shape really well, which you can imagine is pretty important if you want to actually touch the surface of this very kind of rocky, dangerous body. We do have a couple cameras on board. It's obviously very important for us to look at pictures of the surface. Um, that tells us a lot about the rocks themselves, you know, how how fine are the grains? What size pebbles do we have on the surface? It is really interesting because it can uh, it can be a bit difficult to get a sense of scale when you're looking at these photos. And so the photo on the bottom right here shows a big black boulder and perched on it is this little white rock, uh, which is actually the size of a person. Um, so now you can kind of put yourself there and imagine that you're on the surface of Bennu. We also have Otis, which is a thermal emission spectrometer, which uh, measures the thermal infrared wavelengths and does tell us about the composition of the surface. And it also tells us about the surface temperature. What I'll talk about a little more in depth today, though, is OVIRS. Um, OVIRS is a Goddard instrument. It is the visible and infrared spectrometer that was used to map minerals and organics on the asteroid surface. So the way OVIRS works is you can imagine that you are sitting in this photo where the spacecraft is. Imagine you're perched on top of it. And so when the sun hits the surface and bounces off that surface, your eye can see visible wavelengths. And so you'll see some, some color of the asteroid. OVIRS can actually see the same thing. It can see the whole visible wavelength region but it also sees other wavelengths that your eye can't detect. And so that gives us a lot of information um, by looking at these near infrared wavelengths. If your eye could go out there too, you could look outside your house and you know, see vegetation and it would look strange and funny. Um, and in the same way, you know, we can detect areas where 
there are specific minerals and specific uh, types of bonds uh, that show up in our spectra. And so, as Jose was saying, from the meteorites, we know that there are a number of simple organic molecules, um, especially in this one type of meteorite, the carbonaceous chondrites, which we think are linked to Bennu, that, that Bennu may be the source of, of similar types of meteorites. Um, and so what we can do is we can compare what we see in a meteorite like Murchison. So the red line on the plot that I'm showing on the right here is a is what oviers would see from uh, the organics in a meteorite. And the black or gray line is what we see when we look at Bennu. Uh, and so this is a big part of my job is to look at these squiggly lines and, and try and make sense of them. But at, at base, we're kind of looking and we see a dip for both of them, uh, you know, at around 3.4 microns. And that we know is due to carbon and hydrogen bonds uh, in organic molecules. And so we see that in the Murchison meteorite organics as expected. And we also see that on Bennu's surface. Uh, we also see a big, what we call an absorption feature, again, a dip in this our squiggly line um, due to hydrated minerals. So we think that water interacted with rocks on the surface and the fingerprint of that is found in these spectra uh, as, as this dip that, that we are now able to see with the spacecraft of modern day Bennu. Uh, this isn't, you know, like organics in the solar system, first time ever. Bennu, our detection at Bennu is not, um, it's not a first, it just confirms what we expected to see of this carbonaceous asteroid. In fact, we've seen uh, this sort of organic signature and spectra of other dark asteroids, uh, including places like Ceres uh, and Themis. And so what this really does is it helps us to map out at a much greater scale where we're finding these particular compositions through the solar system. And that gives us a sense of what the early solar system looks like, which again plays into this uh, you know, search for where could life have come from. Uh, so if there are organics distributed in, in these places and could these asteroids have gotten to Earth um, and delivered organics to early Earth. So with our spacecraft, we then can put together this basic timeline where we start, uh, you know, the earliest stage of solar system formation, you have a disk of gas and ice and silicates and in there are some basic organic molecules we think that were then incorporated in all incorporated into this Bennu what we call the parent body it's not Bennu as we know it today it's it's that this first big asteroid and all of those things ended up in there and they stayed in there through then that parent body being broken up completely obliterated and turned into a smaller uh, little object, which is Bennu as we know it today. Um, so we can trace that history of these materials from the earliest formation to what we're seeing on the surface today. And then there's that alternate history where Bennu didn't, uh, the parent body didn't break up and we didn't visit it today with the spacecraft, but instead uh, a body like it could have hit early Earth uh, and delivered those materials to early Earth, which again is why we're so interested in grabbing a piece of it. And so this, the still photo from this has been shown a few times, but I really love this video that shows us actually collecting the sample from the surface. And even this in itself is a science experiment because we had some predictions of how firm the rocks might be. Um, and you can see from this how easy they are to break apart that, you know, we think we penetrated uh, half a meter at least into the surface. So, you know, these rocks are, are very easy to break apart. And so you can imagine that if one of them came to Earth as a meteorite, as, 
you know, and tried to pass through our atmosphere, a lot of this material is going to get lost. Um, but it's not lost now because we were able to collect that sample and, and it will come back with us. And uh, Jose had some nice photos from his lab, but you know, an important point in all of this is that there are incredible measurements that we're able to do on Earth uh, with very large instruments that we can't carry with us on a spacecraft, which is exactly why we are, you know, why we want to bring some sample back with us. We can't do it all with the spacecraft. The spacecraft gives us gives us context. And then people like Jose give us the more really high resolution detail about what these organic molecules are, um, you know. And one really cool thing about the Osiris Rex sample is that uh, about half of it will be measured now in our labs across the world, but also half of it is going to be put into storage. Uh, because we've made such great leaps in our technology for studying these samples on Earth uh, that we want to have some saved so that future scientists, you know, kids being born now who invent an incredible new technology can study these samples as well. And so with that, uh, I will end my talk and we can do some questions. Well, great. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your fascinating insight here. Uh, we've got a handful of questions that came in through the chat. Uh, the first one, uh, what if there is life on Mars, but different than we know life to be? How are we protecting life in other forms as we explore our, the universe? Hi, this is Heather again. Yeah, I think that that question kind of falls in the kind of work that I do, where we're trying to think about um, definitions of life and new definitions of life that don't just rely on what we recognize from what we see here on Earth. And I think um, the questioner got to some really important points that there is no reason why we can't think of other models for life. Um, so, so the kinds of things that you could think about being important to look for would be molecular complexity or, or structural complexity that is very unlikely without extra energy in a system that normally comes from life. So many of the kinds of molecules that Hannah and Jose talked about um, in in meteorites, um, of course, were made without life, but they can have very particular uh, shape, um, like when Jose was talking about left-handed chirality, which we associate with life. So if you suddenly see a molecule with only that one shape, when you know that nature makes it in a mix of shapes, that becomes an indication that there's some special process happening that could be life that's making um, that, that expression that's so unique um, that you wouldn't just see in nature without life. And we go to great lengths to keep our spacecrafts clean. OSIRIS-REx was an extraordinarily clean when it left because we're looking for all of these really common molecules that can be on organisms that are also in the meteorite. And we want to make sure that we don't contaminate not just with other critters, but with other molecules that can become false positives for finding life on another body. I hope that answers the question fully. Thanks, so great discussion. Okay, next question. Uh, how does new information that builds even the simplest life forms enter these prebiotic organic molecules? Well, I, I don't know if, if I um, have it right, but um, so for example, in in the case of me, uh, organic compounds in meteorites, as Hannah uh, was saying, uh, the idea is that uh, the very small basic building blocks of molecules, and we are thinking about molecules that will have maybe one or two carbon atoms and a few um, hydrogens or ox oxygens, uh, will be um, sitting in this dust, right, that they will eventually collapse and form um, solar system bodies, for example, or extrasolar system bodies. And so um, when they are um, put into, let's, let's think of this as these are uh, um, uh, balls of, of dust and, and ice, right? And then you apply a source of energy, like for example, radiation in uh, UV radiation, let's say, um, then there is chemistry that's gonna be uh, following up. So um, the compounds themselves uh, most likely are not going to be 
trap as they were made in the uh, before the solar system was formed, but uh, a good chunk of them will be made um, uh, during that process and during the, the time that they were sitting uh, orbiting the sun. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, what would you guys say? Is that what uh, the question was about? I think so. I think so. I think that uh, you know, helps me understand a little bit. Thank you, Jose. Um, let me go on to the next question. Uh, did anyone get stellar occultation maps of Bennu before arrival? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, we did have some ground based spectra. Um, so like I was showing an OVIR spectrum in one of my plots. And so we were able to actually get some of those wavelengths measured from the ground um, from a telescope in Hawaii. Uh, but I actually don't know if anyone has occultation measurements. Uh, but it is very nice in general to be able to, you know, take measurements on the ground and then look at them in space too. So for instance, at Bennu, we were able to really confirm that that, that ground-based spectrum was very similar to what we saw in space. And then we were able to look way up close and see a lot more detail spectrally, you know, variations of very small uh, spatial resolution across the body. Okay, um, thanks for that insight. Uh, let me go on to the next question, a very specific question. Uh, the Miller Array experiment, U-R-E-Y, uh, was performed in 1952. Has there ever been any attempt to replicate this experiment with current technology? Um, as a matter of fact, yes. Uh, this uh, experiment has been replicated several, several times, uh, especially um, by a team um, which we have a colleague here in our lab um, that did his entire PhD, um, so his doctorate work on the analysis of those type of samples. And yes, we have uh, used modern uh, techniques and those uh, 60 years ago. And uh, we found the same thing. We found that um, uh, we can make uh, the very small building blocks of life, uh, like amino acids, uh, nucleobases, uh, we can make compounds that could uh, make a cell wall, like uh, carboxylic acids. And so um, based on that, we can uh, have an inventory of all the compounds that, that were present at that time. And so now we have to find out what chemical reactions could have put these pieces together so that we can make, for example, a double helix or proteins or uh, a cell, right? And um, well, if, if you if this person wants more information, his name is Eric Parker, and um, there's a group of uh, researchers at the University of um, Georgia that, that do this type of uh, uh, Uri Miller, Uri Miller uh, experiments um, frequently. So, okay, Thank you. sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, the next question came in was, where in our solar system do you think is the most promising place to support life of any kind? And, and I'll even say they probably should say the second most promising place. <laughs> I'll take that one since I showed the ladder of life. I think when we're thinking about, um, you know, the probability that something might um, be there, the first question to ask yourself is, are you talking about alive now or alive in the past? Because our solar system is billions of years old. And so a lot of times when we go to other solar system bodies, we're looking to see if there was ever life there, not just life there now. But if you're starting to think about promising places for life now, you can think about what those kind of things that might be at the bottom of the ladder of life. Um, so is there a solvent for life there? Here on Earth, our solvent is, of course, water. That's not the only solvent that's out there that life could use, but that's a really common one that we can think about. You can think about if there's a good energy source um, on that planet. So is there, uh, you know, the sun is a great source of energy here on Earth, but of course we also have radiation and reactions happening in the 
in the rocks of our own planet that can become that energy source. So that could give you an idea of how close is a planet to a star? Um, is it still geologically active so that there are those kind of reactions happening within the planet itself that release necessary energy? Um, so I think that's probably an unsatisfying answer because I'm not going to give you <laughs> the name of a planet or moon uh, that you can count on, but rather ask you to think about the kinds of things that life needs and think about when we think about even solvents and energy and, and nutrient availability. So are there necessary things like carbon and nitrogen that we know life needs here or even light elements of any source? Are those sorts of things there? That's how to know if you're going to find life there. The kinds of things you need for fast chemistry. Um, and that's what's implied by light elements and solvents. No, I think that actually is satisfying because the whole continuum, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't know of it and it, it makes sense that, you know, we're, we're not talking about, you know, um, uh, advanced life at this stage, you know, the first thing we'd find. Okay, let me ask one last kind of uh, rapid round of each of you, um, just kind of about your background um, with our last question before I turn it back to Dina. Um, you know, as chemists, your careers could have gone many directions and me, many people might not think of NASA as a place for chemists. Um, so maybe just, you know, how did you get involved in the search for life at, at NASA? You know, was there one person, class, or kind of point where it was again most interested with, uh, for each of you? I'll, I'll let you jump in. Each of you. I can start us off. Um, so I was an undergrad at Washington University in St. Louis. And so for me, it was a particular person. Ray Arvidson was there, and he was uh, working on the Mars rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, which had landed fairly recently um and he really you know let me in on that project even as an undergrad and that was what got me hooked um and i still have a very soft spot in my heart for mars and for those rovers they've done a lot of work and i think that's the first place a lot of people think when they think about astrobiology uh, it was the first place our one of the first places our community as a whole like really took a, a strong look at i think i can go next uh with a slightly less academic answer which is i first got really interested in in this topic from books uh the book that i remember reading that got me most interested in origins of life and evolution believe it or not was beak of the finch which was written about birds in the galapagos island and i was just blown away by the the way that feedback in nature is reflected in an organism's body so dramatically so charismatically as it is with those birds and combining that with all of the garbage science fiction that i was constantly filling my brain with where i was thinking about other planets all the time it was just a natural sort of yuri miller primordial soup of imagination that happened in my mind and got me interested in this topic jose so um honestly i don't know I uh, when I finished my when I was about to finish my um, PhD, uh, I, I got a PhD in organic chemistry, and um, honestly, I was uh, looking for uh, postdoctoral positions, uh, probably in the pharmaceutical industry. And during that time, uh, as I was looking for for um, for a position in in a in a pharma, in pharma, I came across this uh, advertisement of uh, looking for an astrobiologist to uh, look for organic compounds in, in meteorites. And I found it so fascinating. I, I didn't even consider that there could be organic compounds in, in space rocks, right? That I I had to apply to that job because I had all the, all the background, all the techniques needed. I, I knew everything about doing that job, but I didn't know anything about astrobiology or space. And so even though I, I got uh, really good offers to go into the pharmaceutical industry. I end up taking this uh, position in, in astrobiology because it was just so fascinating to me. And so <laughs> here I am. Yeah. Wow, fantastic. Three, three wonderful routes to uh, the sciences. Uh, thanks for all your time. I'll turn it back to uh, Dina. Once again, I muted myself, so I'm going to learn one eventually. But thank you, Dennis, for moderating the Q&A with Drs. Graham. Ponte and Kaplan for today's presentation. Special thank you to our producer, Travis Woolrab, who tells me when I'm muted. 
and to other people who are working behind the scenes, such as Lonnie Shankman. To our audience, I hope you've enjoyed today's session and you leave knowing a little bit more about Goddard. Next month is super busy for us. Or um, We have the Lucy Mission, which launches this Saturday, I believe it is, the 16th. The Maryland STEM Fest begins on Thursday, and NASA STEAM-a-thon is on November 18th. Right now, you can submit your applications for spring internships, and you never know where you find an internship, so please take some time to look at those. Next month's Getting to Know Goddard topic is non-traditional careers at NASA. It will be on November 18th at a new time, 11 to 11.45 a.m. Eastern Time. If you'd like to be notified of upcoming presentations, Travis has posted the, um, the a link where you can sign up for our mailing list. So thank you. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day.